afternoon and welcome to Moments with Melinda. My guest today is Alec Webb. Hi, Alec. Hi, Melinda. <laughs> How are you today on this unseasonably warm couple of days? Uh, it's gorgeous out here. I'm, I'm great. Thanks. You're doing well. Well, that's wonderful. Let me let me share with my viewers a little bit about your illustrious life. Um, Alec Webb is the president of Shelburne Farms. He helped plan and coordinate the development of Shelburne Farms as a nonprofit organization and has been active in local land use planning, agriculture, and environmental education projects for many years. In 2006, Alex was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science degree from Middlebury College. Vermont Governor Madeleine Cunin honored Alec in 1990 for his extraordinary contributions to Vermont, and he received the Vermont Land Trust Richard W. Carbon Community Conservation Award in 1998. So there you go. That's just a that's just a small minute uh, touch of your extraordinary <laughs> life and what you have contributed to Vermont and to our world. So here we go. Um, right. Now, Alec, Shelburne Farms has been a big part of your entire life. Would you share with my viewers a little bit about growing up at Shelburne Farms? Sure. Um, actually, I was at a, a, a conference one time and the person who was speaking said something like, all of you in the room who, if you go back to your home place, don't recognize it, raise your hand. And I was ambivalent about that because I, our, our family home was um, near the dairy barn. So for those of you who know Shelburne Farms, there's the milking barn and, and as you're going towards the lake on the way to the end on the right. And our family home was uh, just maybe two or 300 yards north of the milking barn. So my dad built that barn in 1952, which, which was the year I was born. So we grew up in a house that was just through the woods from the milking barn. So our, our world, and that's one of six kids, there's, there's six of us in my generation. So our world was very, I don't know if small is the right word, but you know, it was it was about our, our home and the milking barn and the, the farm operations. And I was on uh, Orchard Point, which was, we, there was a, a calf barn and the, you know, we had a horse barn and stuff. So it was, it, um, and, but today it's a, it's a more of a residential area. So, you know, if I went back, or when I go back to Orchard Point, it's a completely different environment than I grew up in. Um, and Shelburne Farms is is also a lot different in that, um, again, when we were growing up, it was all about, it was a working dairy farm. So that was our whole context for growing up. And now it's, you know, this amazing, it still is even, the, I guess, the, the thread of continuity is, is the working farm, but um, it's just so, you know, enjoyed by so many people now in so many different ways. It's, it's real, also quite a different environment. But what an incredible life growing up on this dairy farm on that incredible piece of property. Um, and you've been there yeah. your whole life and you live there with your, with your parents and your siblings and, and yeah. just what, what, a beautiful, what a beautiful, wonderful childhood you must have had. Um, so <laughs> who, who or what do you believe helped to focus your life's work on promoting and educating humans on the importance of our planet's health. Who had the, who had the greatest influence on you, Alec? Oh, wow. Um, well, I, I, uh, I, I went, I was, I was sent off to private school fairly young, at a young, well, in the fifth grade, which is like, I can't imagine sending one of my kids off in fifth grade. Um, so that was good for in terms of like maybe learning study skills and you know <laughs> discipline doing homework or that type of thing. It wasn't so great in the emotional IQ world. Um, but it was so I was in an environment in the 60s, you know, so I graduated from high school in 1970. That uh, while there were benefits, you know, from the kind of the intellectual side, it really it felt like I was in kind of a bubble and that the um, the education I was getting was kind of disconnected from what was going on in the 60s in the real world. So I, I, um, there were teachers, there were, you know, I mean, the, the, the readings that we were doing, you know, Dana Meadows and others, you know, early on, the early environmental thinkers and writers, Rachel Carson and others. Um, so I think it was, you know, and, um, yeah, it's hard to, uh, for me to pinpoint a you know, single individual, but it was more the context of growing up 
in the 60s uh, with the um, in, in feeling this desire to um, you, know, you know seek more meaningful uh, educational opportunities for myself and 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 you know as, as a way of creating change in the world. You were part of the 60s revolution, as was I, and we can we can attribute you know civil rights and women's rights and disability rights and environmental rights Earth Day to yep. the 17 percent of our youth who stood up and and were revolutionaries and yeah yeah so you had Shelburne Farms you know in that kind of was under increasing development pressure you know when suburban you know the strip development was pushing south on Route Seven so you had so. Um, yeah, those pressures in the context of the, the the global situation is what led to the thinking around uh, creating a nonprofit organization that could use Shelburne Farms as a resource for, you know, helping address some of those larger societal and environmental issues. Which is what you did. So, uh, to my viewers, how would you characterize Shelburne Farms as somebody who has lived there and helped it to grow to what it is today? How would you characterize Shelburne Farms? Well, Shelburne Farms today is this amazing place for learning. You know, we're an education organization and our mission is to inspire and cultivate learning for a sustainable future. So it's um, it's this combination of this incredibly beautiful working farm and landscape um, with an, an educational idea that, that goes far beyond uh, the, this this place, uh, but it's grounded in in place. Um, so I'd like to think of our of Shelburne Farms as this amazing local community resource that is, uh, in, you know, globally connected through a, a network of of uh, organizations and individuals who are concerned about uh, the future of of our world. And, and it's one of the top five places that people go to visit when they come to Vermont. Yeah, and we have this interesting dynamic. We, we we don't promote ourselves as a as a as a as a tourist attraction because we really want. Um, we're an educational organization with this amazing campus that we want to welcome people to come and enjoy. But we're we're, we're here to create this place of learning, not just to get as many people as possible to to come. You know, and and visit and leave. It's really one of the things I love about or what they, through COVID was, you know, you have people from the local community coming out to walk, you know, multiple times a week. So that kind of, as opposed to someone just coming and experiencing Shelburne Farms and, and leaving and not coming back, it's that kind of deep um, connection with the local communities, what um, really is a lot of what makes Shelburne Farms, I think, so special. But I, I've, I've had people who have come from other countries staying with us who go to Shelburne yeah. Farms and go back. Yeah, yeah. Came from with what they took away from Shelburne yeah. Farms. So um, it, it, it inspires and creates wisdom in people's hearts who have, who have gone there. It, I think it's one of the great wonders of the world. But anyway... So, Alec, what do you consider the greatest challenges you have faced as you worked to create this internationally revered and inclusive experience known as Shelburne Farms? Well, I definitely have been working for a long time on this, but I'm, Shelburne Farms is not here because of me. No. <laughs> there are so many people who um, have made it work in a way, and I'm, uh, I feel like part of my role has been not like maybe like a stage hand in a way, you know, like creating an environment where amazing people can can do amazing work here. And there have been so many that that um, uh, along the way that that have done that. So um, you're, well, you're the like the wizard in a way, helping well, yeah. or, or, or the conductor, <laughs> maybe the conductor or the director. Maybe. But yeah. what what is one of the greatest challenges? Was it was it, yeah. was it taking it as a family home? And respite and turning it into the nonprofit, or yeah. was it? Um, what, what do you what do you feel were some of the greatest challenges? And to my viewers who may not know this, Shelburne Farms is is in Shelburne, Vermont, um, 
And uh, so I'm going to, and, and I also want you to know that their, their website is, is shelburnefarms.org. And I suggest you visit their website. Yeah. Uh, so the challenges there keep evolving, you know? So in the, uh, so the, the nonprofit was incorporated in 1972, and that was it was just an idea. The place was still owned privately, much by my father. And so I, so I guess that the challenge at that time was envisioning a, a different, you know, future for this place. Because if it had just kind of gone the normal course of events, it would have been become a high end subdivision, I guess, you know, suburban subdivision for a golf course or whatever private club. So. I think the first step was re-envisioning a, a, a different future. Um, and then was, but and then the reality was like, then how do you <laughs> realize that um, future? And it was uh, so it was it was a community coming together to to help think about and, and bring that along. So that our family, you know, so my dad had to think about. How to handle things, and we all asked him to leave the property to the nonprofit. So, which he did when he died unexpectedly. At my, you know, I'm 70. He he dropped dead at 70 with, from a heart attack, and he was a kind of old school where he hadn't discussed his estate plan with us explicitly. Kind of, you know, his will was his business type thing. But when he he had in fact had decided to leave the, the property to the nonprofit, so that was the good news is that you know six of us didn't inherit it and. Then, you know, divided up so it went to the, the the single nonprofit entity, but there was no endowment. There, you know, the plate, all the major buildings were falling to the ground. Um, the there wasn't revenue to cover the operating expenses, and there. But the we had through the '70s. Um, uh, my first wife Marilyn was, you know, played a role in, in it with my, you know, Marshall who passed away last year, and others, you know, starting planting the seeds of the, the education program. So they were there, but there was still an early developmental phase. So it was, how do you, you know, build a board, build a staff, um, create uh, sources of revenue um, and build a program. And, you know, um, so that's what we've been working on since then. And now um, um, we have this, amazing place but now we have to think about the next 50 years and setting that up for success and um but it's and, and you know so in the 80s um megan camp was my partner and yet we've had this part you know we've been working together in a leadership role with with, with marshall you know since the 80s and the challenges program on the program end you know how do you take um some great programs that are serving a local local audience and um, create a, an international network of educators that are making a difference in their own schools and communities around the world. So I don't know, it's been a, it's a, you know, how to weave together, you know, all of the different aspects of Shelburne Farms into this wonderful whole, you know, that is, that is inspiring and cultivating learning for a sustainable future. That's the, that's the big challenge. And we we're making steady progress with that. And you did it. You did it. <laughs> you did it so beautifully. So let's move on to Shelburne Farms as an educational nonprofit predicating on cultivating learning for a sustainable future. Can you explain a little bit more about this mission? Yeah. Um, so as I said, we have this, we want to use this amazing place to invite people on a learning journey around sustainability. And um, and then we, and, and our, our focus has been largely around young people. So, you know, um, helping, and the way to have the greatest impact is by working with educators uh, who, you know, spend their careers working with multiple classes. Uh, so, uh, it's really about um, supporting education that's tied to place and community and um, um, uh, engages young people in developing a sense that they can make a difference uh, in the world. Um, so how, how many how many how many students do you think you reach in a year with your program? 
Well, we have, um, so our, you know, direct service programs on the farm, we have probably, I don't know, I have the number off the top of my head, but you know, eight to 10,000 probably young people come through the programs. Our children's farmyard has, you know, and before COVID, we had, I don't know, 30,000 families and kids come through there. Um, and and, uh, and it, we, you know, work with uh, probably around 1,500 educators this year. Um, both, you know, some will come for institutes on site, but we also work virtually now or our educators go to other schools and communities. So some of the finest Vermont products are grown, milked and created at Shelburne Farms, notably your cheeses and your breads. And I, and I believe your hams too, at least in your gift baskets, you have the best hams ever. Um, talk a little bit with my viewers about regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, uh, but, uh, life ultimately rests on, on soil, I guess, you know, healthy soil and, and healthy ecosystem. So to the extent, so our, our goal has been to farm in a way that um, is good for the environment and creates healthy food for, for to, you know, help support healthy local food systems. Um, so our, our dairy, you know, we, the, as I said, that my dad started the dairy in 1952. Um, and in the 70s, you know, wholesale milk production was challenging. And so in the late 70s, we tried bottling raw milk. And we were, I think at one point, we were selling about 12,000 half gallons of wheat locally. We had a little truck going around to the supermarkets. And then we transitioned that into making raw milk cheddar cheese in the early 80s. So that that added, that that was a strategy for adding value to the milk to help, you know, um, provide the revenue to help support the working landscape here and, and produce a, a wonderful product, you know, that would help feed people and, and help sustain the organization. Um, and, and with our woodlands too. So we have the, our, our working farmland that supports the, the dairy and the cheese making and a small flock of sheep for lamb and um, a small beef herd. And then we, our woodland supports a maple sugaring operation now that where we make about 1200 gallons of syrup a year. And we've managed the woodlands for both the, the saw logs and the firewood, but also for wildlife and, you know, and for people to enjoy through walking and that type of thing. Do you think your parents would be proud of you for what you've done? Do you think they'd be all pumped and excited and enthusiastic? Uh, well, my, my mother outlived my dad by a few years, but no, I think my, my father would, you know, he, so he, he died in 1984 before this a lot, you know, unfolded. So I, I think he would, it would be fun to tour around with him. Sure. I think you'd feel, I think it'd be, feel great to see the, the dairy still going and just kind of probably be amazed to see the, the, you know, the, the, the large buildings because he, he, he had decided to basically abandon or let go of the major, you know, estate buildings. He, he didn't foresee a future, you know, he wasn't trying to bring back the private estate qualities. He was just trying to make it work as a working dairy. So, so for him to, to see what you've done with it. To see the public enjoy and kids and so I think, yeah. yeah. Be, and yeah. All the <laughs> events that you show and the yeah. events that you hold there. Yeah. Um, so Alec, share with us the history of this land that you steward um, mm -hmm. and the Abenaki influence that you so honor today. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this land, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's an amazing piece of property and that um, at 10,000 years or more ago, the Abenaki were, were here and we're, we're trying to really work on acknowledging the whole story of the, the land here and um, not to start with the, you know, the webs coming to town. So the, so yeah, so, you know, as in the rest of Vermont, you know, we, the Abnaki, you know, were displaced and the land taken by the European settlement that happened. And then at, at Shelburne Farms, that, that ended up being like a, 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 a community of 30, something farms that were uh, going in the in the mid 1980s and then when the my great grandparents came to town they purchased uh, those 
you know, I, th um, I think 36 farms and consolidated them into uh, what's Shelburne Farms today. Actually, it was a larger property at that time. Um, and they brought in uh, Frederick Law Olmsted uh, to help kind of conceptualize the, the layout. And that's why I feel when you come in, it feels more park-like or, you know, it's not like a typical Vermont landscape. It's sort of curvilinear road systems and the way the plantings were developed to kind of highlight different spatial relationships and views that that was Olmsted's influence, which is pretty great because he Olmsted did Central Park and other parks, but I think he, the, the story goes that he was interested in working with private properties like this that he thought might someday, you know, go into the public realm because that was his real interest was in creating spaces that everybody could enjoy, not just the, the, the wealthy few. So, so what brought your, your great grandparents or your grandparents, what brought them to Vermont to, and what brought them to Vermont and that, that piece of land? Yeah. Well, he, so he, my great grandfather married Lila Vanderbilt mm -hmm. and her family was in the railroad business. So I guess he came up to look at the railroads or whatever, and they fell in love with this area and ended up after she, and she, I guess, didn't have a real concept of, you know, she inherited $10 million in the 1880s. Um, and they used that fortune to, you know, buy land and build children farms. But they weren't particularly good business people though. There's kind of like they won the lottery and they, you know, they, they, they spent it well, but it, Well, you're, well, you, you and the world are benefactors of that, but they weren't farmers. No, well, he was totally into horses, you know, so he built these big barns to, to, you know, to breed and um, use horses to, to maintain the property. And she was very, you know, loved gardens and horticulture. So she she was behind developing the, the gardens, the flower gardens near the, the inn. And Shelburne Museum was started by? Uh, that, so the, my grandfather's brother married Alexa Havemeyer. So it was um, a family connection there yeah that's yeah. part of the museum which is an yeah. extraordinary asset as asset so talk to us a little bit about shelburne farms institute for sustainable schools and as we all know it will be our youth who save what will be their future so is how how is shelburne farms helping them in that quest well so um the um as i mentioned megan camp came here in the early 80s and um, has been building our, our, our program outreach and has, has, has um, developed a lot of partnerships around the world. And um, uh, and so the Institute for Sustainable Schools really is the culmination of a lot of that effort with her colleagues who we've got this amazing crew of educators here. So it really the Institute for Sustainable Schools is the umbrella for our work with educators and supporting um, yeah, this network of educators who are committed to educating for sustainability. Um, and we have a, a great partnership, a long-time partnership with the University of Vermont that's, you know, through various colleges, but um, they're our lead partner in the Institute and that um, they have a certificate program in education for sustainability that, that may evolve into a graduate. And, and um, I can, I can, I, I can assume that many of my viewers that their children may have gone through a program at Shelburne Farms. Yeah, so we use, so when educators or you know, teachers come here with their kids, they can learn how to use a place like Shelburne Farms to enhance their learning experiences. But the, the goal isn't to have every child in Vermont or the world come to Shelburne Farms, it's for every community in Vermont and around the world to have educators who can have the, the skills and the confidence to use their local community resources and special places as extensions of their learning environment. So that's that's the real that that'll be the real measure of success. So you're teaching the the teachers to teach. Yes, yeah. Because that's how it works. But I think we all remember that the recycling program in Vermont was actually started by the children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's... brought it to their parents and said, you know, why are you throwing that up? So anyway, bless yeah, yeah. Our, bless our sweet children. 
So, yeah. you're, so I, I, I want to touch a little bit on your brother, Marshall Webb, mm -hmm. who passed away last summer, and it was a deep and profound loss to all of us and many people around the world, but especially to you and your family. Can you share with us the Marshall Webb Earth Day 2028 challenge, and how can my viewers um, get involved? Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Uh, one of our big organizational commitments is uh, to improve our stewardship practices. And um, so, of course, with climate change being such a global issue, we want to uh, become, or, or set the, the goal of becoming net zero, beyond net zero um, by 2028 uh, in our practices. Um, and, and, and it largely, I mean, just to be good stewards of what we're responsible for, but also to, to help build this inspiring learning environment uh, so that, you know, it can be a place where people can see, you know, our, you know how we went about that process and, and what it might look like. So we, um, and that's part of a ongoing fundraising efforts. We have a climate action fund that we're raising funds to first uh, put together our, our planning framework for achieving net zero. And then of course, we'll take a significant investment to accomplish it. Um, so, so you're creating you're creating within your environment at Shelburne Farms um, an example of yeah. sustainable practices. So, yeah. for my viewers, if you are interested in supporting Shelburne Farms and supporting the Marshall Webb Earth Day 2028, you can go to the website shelburnefarms.org and make a donation, and that would be I, we all would be very grateful for you to do that. Um, well, that's just fabulous, Alec, and bless your sweet brother's heart. Um, what would your words of wisdom for our children today who are facing planet warming, hence the last few days, attacks on our democracy and other challenges that for them seem so daunting? Well, um, I, let's see what I have. I guess th that um, that we can all make it, we, we can all make a difference, you know, in our um, that um, that together, you know, that, like if if we all do what we can. Actually, I just found this amazing quote um, or that was this book, this book called Buddha's Brain by Rick Hansen, but, but he said. We will do it. This quote that he, this is from a, somebody named Nikosi Johnson. Do all that you can with all that you have in the time that you have in the place that you are. And I was thinking, I might add, you know, with the people and community you love, but that's, you know, I think we just, with whatever resources we have, and, and for young people, you know, I think it's to, you know, my, you know, to be young and then when you, as you grow older, you know, grow into a kind of a, have the you know, if every kid had the sense that they could make a difference in their lives, uh, that would be so wonderful. Well, it's tough for kids today, especially yep. the pandemic and yeah, what they're seeing on TV and yeah, and especially those that you know who are disenfranchised. It's very difficult. Yeah. Yep. So, um, as we face eighty-five degree weather over the past few days, which has been very beautiful. All the daffodils have blossomed, but it is disturbing in a way. What is your hope for humanity's future 25, 50 years down the road? What do you see? Um, well, let's see. I, I, that <laughs> You've got such diversion. You, know, you have a lot of reason for hope and a lot of reason for pessimism. I, I think that I'm, I don't know. I, well, I, I, well, let me help you here. Yeah. All the children and all the students and the teachers and the people that you're putting through Shelburne Farms, they're, they're the hope for the future. And yeah. you must yep. see that every day in the work that you and your, and your team are doing. Yeah. To give you great hope. Yes, that's true. Yep. I mean, that, and I think the, biggest hope would be that the people like ourselves who have access to 
opportunity and resources that many don't that that everybody really uses them to in every possible way for the betterment of all you know i mean that that's um i think that's the real hope perhaps um that that, that will happen you're here now another thing i wanted to bring up because i've been thinking about this for the last five or six years the word sustainability doesn't really work for me anymore because i don't know if we can if we really if we can sustain what we have with where we are so yeah. i'm hearing the word used a lot amongst environmentalists the word adaptability mm -hmm. where do you land on that alec um i love adaptability resilience um but i'm still hanging in there with sustainability not because it's you know who wants to just be sustainable but on the other hand there's a lot of good things in that word you know in terms of long-term thinking so to me it's it's more it, it doesn't have the quality of life thing that jumps out but if you I think the, the importance of thinking long term that that's what sustainability still resonates for me about you know it's really it's like not just looking at short term how far out, how far out do you think well until the sun goes out I guess I don't know you know it's good. we're working on a that's a long time frame but you know <laughs> Good for you, Alec Webb, <laughs> until the sun comes out. Well, I have no doubt you're going to be around. I don't know where or or, or where you're, you're, you're going to be, but you're going to be making um, a big difference wherever you are. In closing, um, this is kind of fun. Can you tell my viewers what baby animals they can see and pet at your farmyard? Uh, I think it's a, a, we have some goats and some uh, the cutest baby lambs now. We aren't really officially... Open. I mean, the trails are open, but people can swing by. Uh, you know, the goats, the sheep. You know, we have a little calf up there in the summer, and um, yeah. But, but, but I think the goats are probably my favorite. The cute as well. They're goat really yoga, you there. know, goat yoga now. Where baby yeah. goats are helping people get through yoga. Well, listen, we've come to the end of this interview, and I just want to tell you that for many, many years, I've admired you and loved you, and and I and the work that you and your family have done and your team is extraordinary. So I want to thank you for your time to be on my show. And I wish you a beautiful day, Alec. Well, thanks, Melinda. I said, I, there was somebody once told me that my main job is thanking people. And I, I feel like I never do that adequately. But thank you. And I just for people who are seeing this who have been supporting the farm, I just want to thank everybody. You know, it's been an amazing where it is an amazing community that's making Shelburne Farms possible. So it's a great village. Yeah, it really That's is. Really a great community. And to my viewers, I want to thank you for, for, um, for watching my show. And I will see you shortly. Enjoy this day. And I say goodbye.